At the close of World War I, a daring band of aviators undertook a dangerous mission. To fly the U.S. mail across the vast American continent. With no maps, no radios, and only primitive instruments, they risked their lives to unite a nation by air. It was hard work for those of us who flew these planes. A sense of romance and adventure sustained us. It elated us to conquer time and space. On May 15, 1918, all of official Washington turned out for the inaugural flight of the world's first air mail service. Even President Woodrow Wilson was there. He expected to be impressed. Two planes would fly simultaneously between Washington and New York. Lieutenant George Boyle would pilot the northbound plane just out of flight school, his engagement to a politician's daughter got him the job. The airmail had to beat the train, and the day's success rested on Boyle's young shoulders. He climbed into his Curtis Jenny, and 140 pounds of mail were loaded in a front cockpit. As the crowd watched, Boyle yelled, contact. They tried again. Someone muttered, we're losing a lot of valuable time here. It was the president. They checked the gas tank, empty. At the same moment in New York, the southbound mail plane took off for the nation's capital. Back in Washington, mechanics found some gas, and Boyle was at last on his way. Lieutenant Boyle uh, took off, and unfortunately, he began to follow the railroad tracks that curved rather gently southward. So within a very short time, instead of heading north, he was heading south. He ended up 25 miles south of Washington, D.C., uh, when he landed in the field to ask directions. Boyle's landing skills were no better than his navigating. At least the southbound pilot had better luck. The mail arrived safely in Washington, two hours faster than the train. Two days later, Lieutenant Boyle was given another chance. This time, a road map was taped to his leg, and an escort flew with him all the way to Baltimore. He gave Boyle simple directions. Just keep the water on your right. He waved goodbye, and uh, young Boyle uh, began to fly in the proper direction following that shoreline. But what happens, of course, is the shoreline curves around. He kept curving and curving and curving, and again, headed south once more. His superior remarked, only a lack of gas and the Atlantic Ocean prevented Boyle from going even further south. Boyle never flew the mail again. The airmail service was the brainchild of a bureaucrat. 
the second assistant postmaster general. Otto Prager knew nothing about airplanes, but he figured they could get the mail through faster than the train. His superior, Albert Burleson, was skeptical. Prager recalls giving the message to Burleson uh, one winter day, and Burleson looked out the window at the clouds and rain and said, could airplanes fly in this kind of weather? And Otto Prager, not knowing any better, said, of course they could. At first, the Army flew the mail. They didn't care about delivering letters. It was just a cheap way to train pilots. But Otto Prager had a bolder plan. He believed the airplane would transform American business, just as the railroads had done before. Flying the mail was an ambitious undertaking at that time. Although airplanes were being used, of course, during World War I, uh, these were mainly fair weather, uh, short term flights, whereas the airmail involved a regularity of flight in all kinds of weather that simply was not being done anywhere in the world at that time. Fed up with the Army, Prager took control. The post office, with no background in aviation, would fly the mail itself. But first, Prager had to find the right pilots. Prager was looking for experienced pilots, uh, which were found mainly uh, in civilian instructors for the military. So he was able to very quickly find a rather small group of extraordinarily experienced pilots who pledged uh, to Prager in writing that they would follow the orders of the post office department and fly in all kinds of weather. Max Miller was the first hired. He wrote in his application, I have carefully considered the risks caused by bad weather and would be ready to go out at any time. Hamilton Lee declared, I have never been injured or had a crash in flying. Positively do not drink. In 1918, aviation was still in its infancy. Planes were made of wood, mostly ash and spruce, and held together with wire. Irish linen covered the fragile body. The post office bought a fleet of Curtis Jennies. Built as a wartime trainer, it was a handful to fly. An airplane that's not stable, you cannot take your feet off the rudder bar, you can't take this, let your hand off the stick. The airplane won't stay there. It'll start falling off on one tick, one wing tip or the other. Probably the main difficulty that these airmail pilots had was the fatigue and the long hours. Pilots navigated by instinct and the lay of the land. were no maps. I got from place to place with the help of three things. One was the seat of my pants. Another was to recognize every river, railroad, and yes, every outhouse along the route. The third, I had a few drops of homing pigeon in my veins. Train tracks were always a welcome sight. Pilots called them the iron compass. Yet the powerful railroads were the airmail's biggest threat. Prager decided that in order to compete against the railroad, it would be necessary to fly a longer route. And the most n the natural route that appealed uh, to Prager was between New York and Chicago, which were the two commercial and financial hearts of the nation, where airplanes could cut by half the travel time between these two great commercial centers.
there was a lethal obstacle on the way to Chicago, the Allegheny Mountains. Stretching across central Pennsylvania, their gentle peaks belied hidden dangers. With few landmarks, twisting valleys, and treacherous weather, these mountains were a pilot's nightmare. To test the route, Prager turned to Max Miller, his best pilot. On September 5, 1918, Miller set off from New York in clear skies. Chicago was 700 miles away, and the Alleghenies loomed ahead. Two hours later, fog had set in over the Pennsylvania mountains. Miller was hopelessly lost. With fuel running low, he had to find his first stop, Lock Haven. Desperate to land, Miller could only guess where the town might be. He began descending through the clouds, praying he'd miss the ridges. He had to rely on his sense of feel, the wind on the side of his cheeks, the motion of the airplane as he came uh, through this opaque mass. Breaking through at just 200 feet, Miller found himself right over Lock Haven. The mayor was there to greet him. Miller had no time to waste. Airborne again, his engine quit, and he plunged down towards a farm. He fixed the plane himself. Exhausted, Miller raced on. He reached Chicago 37 hours after he'd left New York. Despite getting lost more times than he cared to remember, Miller declared the proposed route entirely practical. Daily New York-Chicago service began on July 1st, 1919, and beat the train by 16 hours. The airmail was a communications revolution. Just 15 years after the Wright brothers took flight, the airplane was changing America's sense of space and time. Small towns were the key to getting the mail from New York to Chicago. The airmail needed refueling stops, one every 200 miles, or just under the flying time of a tank of fuel. Winning a stop put a town on the map. When Belfont, Pennsylvania, population 5,000, was up for the honor, they went all out to impress the post office. The Town fathers in Belfont decided this was going to be something that would be a big boom for the town. So they went out and got it. They received a telegram from the postal officials saying that on a given day, a pilot would be coming to land and that he was to be given fuel and water and anything else that he needed. And then based on what happened that day, they would decide whether or not to move the field to Belfont. The pilot was again Max Miller. As he approached, the town's excitement grew. The postmaster at the time had a daughter who was a student at St. John's Catholic School, and she convinced the nun that taught her class that this was a historic moment, and these children needed to be out to that airfield to see it. So the nun dismissed the class, and they all went running up to the airfield, 
to see Max Miller land the first plane. They put a big red blanket out on the field to mark it so that he wouldn't miss it. Max Miller was very much of a hero when he landed. He got the big red carpet treatment. The red, you know, the red blanket was out on the field. The charms of Belfont did the trick. On Miller's recommendation, it became a refueling stop. No plane had ever landed in Belfont. Now the mail field became the town's main attraction. Belfont didn't know what hit it. Suddenly there were mail pilots everywhere, swaggering down Allegheny Street and moving in at the Brockerhoff Hotel. The pilots fit very much into the society of the day. It became socially desirable to have a pilot living in your home. The best families were doing it, attorneys, undertakers, the mayor. It made them socially elite. It would be like having a movie star or a rock star move into your home. Slim Lewis would fly down Allegheny Street very close to the uh, weather vane on top of the courthouse just to let his buddies know that he was back in town. Belfont even forgave Lewis when he ran into a local tea house. One pilot was known for flying past the courthouse and dropping his laundry in the middle of Allegheny Street so that the laundress could run out and get it and get started doing his laundry. You have to remember that it took a while to do laundry by hand. Wild Bill Hobson liked to ride his motorcycle up the courthouse steps, among other stunts. Hobson jumped on the wing of an airplane at Belfont to fly to New York. He had a date, and he was promised that trip, and the field manager said no, it was another pal was going to do it. So he went into the hangar, put on a winter flying suit in the summertime, went out and strapped himself to the left wing of the airplane. And as he was taken off, he looked over at the field manager and went like this, and got to New York and made his date. And you can't walk back from an aeroplane, so what are you girls going to do? They did a lot of socializing with old cars and convertibles, and uh, I don't know what else, to what other extents, you know, the socializing went on, but they had parties. There was a swimming pool close by. There were scenes where they were swimming with the girls. By even boys who never in their whole lives were rude are bound to be affected by the high altitude. They were having the time of their lives. They were being treated as heroes. They were getting away with an awful lot of behaviors that other men would not have gotten away with. <laughs> Celebrity came with a high price. A male pilot could only expect to survive about 800 flying hours, the same life expectancy as a light bulb. They were just skimming the tops of those trees and trying to come up to get over top of the mountain ridge, and then put the nose down, cut the power, and hopefully be in the right valley to find the airport. Many times the aircraft would land with the leaves hanging on the bottom of the landing gears. This route became known as Hell Stretch and Graveyard of the Alleghenies because more airmail pilots' lives were lost and more planes were lost in this area than any other stretch of the route.
many times the, the pilots that crashed were people who were very well known. It was like losing a member of your family when one of the pilots died. They were mourned, flags were flown at half-mast, and, and it's like a member of the community had died. Belfont was shaken when one of its favorite pilots disappeared without a trace over Hell's Stretch. Charlie Ames had left New York in bad weather. Charlie Ames was always on time, always very dependable, and one night he just didn't show up. No one heard a crash. No one saw a plane. Ames had vanished. When he was reported down, that resulted in the largest rescue attempt manhunt in Pennsylvania history. And uh, they just couldn't believe that Charlie Ames, one of the more experienced pilots, could be down. There were those who thought that he had taken the mail and absconded to Canada with the checks and securities and all the money out of the mail. Uh, there were those who said Charlie would never do that. He was much too honest. For 10 days, searchers scoured the thick mountain forest. At last, on the top of Nittany Ridge, they found a plane and a body. Charlie Ames died just four miles from the airport and 200 feet below the ridge. Charlie had flown into the side of the mountain at full speed and had crashed. He had been sitting with his legs wrapped around the stick, which meant that he was confident that he was flying over the mountain, not into it. He didn't know that he was about to crash. Ames' primitive altimeter failed to adjust for a dramatic change in barometric pressure between the east coast and the mountains. Mechanics designed a better altimeter, saving other pilots a similar fate. Flying the mail was risky business. Otto Prager's fly or be fired policy made things worse. The pilots were willing to brave a storm they just loathed taking orders from a desk-bound bureaucrat. Most of the pilots uh, didn't care for Prager at all. Uh, they saw him as somebody who knew very little about aviation, uh, who was giving them orders that they couldn't fulfill, and that who was quite willing to sacrifice their lives uh, to get the mail through. The pilots said Prager would sit in his Washington office and gaze out towards the Capitol. If he could see the statue on top, he would insist they fly. Krager was determined with his German stubbornness that the mail was going to go through irregardless of the weather. He insisted that the pilots who had signed a contract to obey his orders, obey his orders. Outraged by Prager's demands, the pilots went on strike. Prager accused them of collusion to delay the mails and threatened to throw them in jail. He fired Hamilton Lee, a top pilot. The press sided with the flyers and accused the post office of risking lives for the sake of a two-cent stamp. Prager also fired Leon Smith, who had sent him a scathing letter. It might be easy, Mr. Prager, for you to sit in your swivel chair in Washington and tell the flyers when they can fly. You do not regard a man's life worth the least respect. A showdown was inevitable. On July 26, 1919, a delegation of pilots went to Washington to meet Prager. In the end, they compromised. Now only the local field manager had the power to order men to fly. 
If there was any doubt, he'd first have to go for a ride himself. Hamilton Lee got his job back. Leon Smith didn't. The pilots demanded better equipment, and they got it. The post office built airstrips and navigation beacons and developed ground-to-air radio. But what they really needed was a bigger, faster mail plane. Prager believed the German-built Junkers JL-6 was the answer. The all-metal plane was hailed as the aircraft of the future. Max Miller was chosen to test it. The son of an English sea captain, Miller had always dreamed of adventure. Now, at age 27, he was at the peak of his career, the finest pilot in the airmail service. He was also in love and had just married Daisy Thomas, a secretary at the post office. Max and Daisy were almost something out of a Scott Fitzgerald novel. Uh, he was tall and blonde, and she was brunette, attractive, and they made a very dashing couple. And they could always be seen strolling arm in arm uh, by the airmail fields. On September 1st, 1920, Miller and his mechanic left New York in one of the new planes. The day before, another Junkers had caught fire in midair. Miller's plane was last sighted low over Morristown, New Jersey. Farmers saw flames coming out of the engine and mail sacks being thrown over the side. Daisy I was working in the airmail office, and one of the clerks came bursting into the office, uh, very excited with the news that the airmail plane had crashed and burned. Uh, she knew Max was the pilot of that plane. All of a sudden, everyone else in the office knew too, and things grew very quiet. Max Miller's death launched a storm of controversy. The New York Sun said the airmail was nothing more than publicity for the post office. The toll of the airmail was high. In 1920 alone, 15 pilots died. And it wasn't only the human cost that was mounting. Congress saw the airmail as a waste of taxpayers' money. It carried 30 million letters a year, but still wasn't turning a profit. They threatened to cut its funding completely. But Otto Prager believed the airmail was essential. He fought back. Just one week after Max Miller's death, Prager launched his most ambitious route yet, the Transcontinental. Flying in relays, pilots would follow the old Pony Express route across the Great Plains and over the Continental Divide. There was no airmail route in the world comparable to the 2,600 miles between New York uh, and San Francisco. Going west of the Mississippi, they had to conquer the high Rockies and the deserts uh, of that rugged western part of the United States. It was a tremendous undertaking that gained the admiration of flyers all over the world.
All the pilots had to get them across the continent was an outdated World War I bomber. The DH-4 was not designed for the airmail. That was pretty obvious from the start. It was designed as a light bomber. The rear seat was originally meant to house a machine gunner. They were meant, like most combat aircraft, for high altitude, short range flights. So the airmail was using them for low altitude, long range flights. So the flight characteristics were not what was needed. One pilot said the DH-4 was made of the cheapest material I have ever seen used. It was also notoriously top-heavy. In a crash, the pilot would be crushed between the mail sacks and the engine. After more than a dozen fatalities, the post office redesigned the DH-4s to make them safer and more powerful. But the planes were still no match for the Rockies. Pushed to the limit, they could climb to 10,000 feet, but the peaks were higher. In the narrow passes, there was no room for error. So if there were any malfunctions in the aircraft whatsoever, you were going down and you were not going down in flat fields like you were back east. You were going down in treacherous mountain terrain that there was no landing area at all. Mountain blizzards could trap a pilot without warning. Forecasts were rudimentary at best. Pilots had to depend on reports phoned in from ground crews. They used to tell me, if you can see the top of the trees at the end of the airport, that's enough for me to come in on. So all you'd have to say when you report CAVU, ceiling and visibility unlimited. That's what that meant. They'd come in just over the top of the hangar they took a lot of chances. One pilot landed in sunshine, but worried about an approaching storm. He called a rancher down the route and asked, what's your ceiling and visibility? What's my what? Came the reply. Is the sky clear? I don't know, broke my glasses. Look, I gotta get the horses. Storm's coming. Western flying required special skills. Slim Lewis had engine trouble over the Wyoming Hereford Ranch, famed for its prize bulls. Slim. One day he was had a forced landing just off the be the south east end of the airport. Slim killed one of the bulls, landed right on the bull. The uh, Wyoming Hereford sent a bill to the postal department saying uh, we need this for the price of the bull. The airmail came back to him and says, What did he do, Slim? You didn't kill the whole herd, did you? And no, just one bull. <laughs> Flying out of Cheyenne, the Western pilots carved out a tough image. They considered themselves the cream of the crop. Like the old Pony Express riders, they went far beyond the call of duty. Whenever his plane went down, a pilot had legal authority to get the mail through any way he saw fit. One pilot, after crashing on a ranch, commandeered a horse and strapped the mail bags tightly over the saddle.
He headed towards the nearest railroad depot, hoping to catch the next train out of town. But after walking away from a plane crash unhurt, he was thrown by the horse and broke his leg. This time, the mail did not go through. Only two years after the airmail's modest beginnings, pilots were crossing America day in, day out. With a sense of adventure not seen since the Wild West, they captured the hearts of a nation as they went on their way. just moved out of the cowboy era and we were looking for heroes. We were looking to expand and we were looking for growth and the airmail pilots epitomized that growth and epitomized that sense of spirit and, and pioneering daring do. Conquering the continent alone in a biplane, armed with a revolver to protect the U.S. mail, pilots were the new cowboys. They lived by their own set of rules. Slim Lewis didn't take anything from anybody. He was in one night, and something happened up at the Palace Hotel. Somebody showed up with a little liquor or something. It was prohibition, but Lewis was known to knock back shots up until he was due to fly. They called in from Omaha, one to talk to him, and he said, well, I'll tell you, that mail will get there when I get ready to bring it down to you. And if that ain't good enough, I'll pull one of the struts off and I'll bring it down and beat your brains out. Now that's the kind of a guy, but he was a friendly sort of fellow. Everybody liked him. Half a continent away in Washington, Otto Prager was finding it harder than ever to control his free-spirited pilots. He set out rules, hoping to rein them in. Pilots shall not wear spurs, and there shall be no stunts while flying the mail. They had all been instructed. They weren't to stunt these planes, but this pilot came in and right over the field, he'd done a couple of loops, took a little dive and then shot it almost straight up, leveled off and came in. When I got ready to get the mail out, he hollered and said, Dross, you didn't see a thing, did you, with me coming in? No, not till you was on the ground there coming in. Thanks. For all the sense of daring do these pilots needed, to survive, you needed to be very on your feet, think quickly, be able to evaluate situations quickly. People didn't live in the airmail service only because they were brave. They did so because they were smart. People that were only brave didn't last very long. When James Murray crashed on a desolate Wyoming mountaintop, he was left with nothing but his wits. Elk Mountain is about halfway between Laramie and Rollins. And it's a nice, prominent mountain that kind of sits out there all by itself. And it's when you need a cloud full of rocks, that's what you run into is Elk Mountain. Murray climbed out of the wreckage and took the mail sacks with him. He trekked through thick snow, slept under a frozen cedar tree, and carried on the next day. By mid-afternoon, he found his way to the small outpost of Arlington. He'd walked for nearly 24 hours. They went up searching for him the next day, 
and they found every step he took in the snow, there was a big bear track right behind him. So he was followed down the mountain by a bear. Every day, pilots were risking their lives. But Congress was not impressed. With Republicans due to take office in March 1921, all funding for the airmail was to be cut. The Republicans made it quite clear that they were not going to support the airmail service. They believed that this was an inappropriate role for the federal government to play and that private enterprise would be better at running this operation. Prager disagreed. Business wasn't ready to fly the mail. He had a daring idea to drum up support and put pressure on Congress. It was unthinkable to fly the transcontinental route not just by day, but by night. To up the stakes, Prager chose a dramatic date for the epic flight, Washington's birthday, 1921. Prager was asking his pilots to do the impossible, fly in complete darkness with nothing to guide them. Two planes took off from New York, two from San Francisco, to simultaneously cross the country. The operation could not have begun under worse circumstances. It was the dead of winter, uh, the weather was poor. Quickly, the planes that started out from New York ran into such bad weather uh, that they had to stop short of Chicago. In the unforgiving western desert, tragedy struck. William Lewis, piloting one of the two eastbound planes, stalled on takeoff and crashed near Elko, Nevada. Now, only a single airplane was left to cover the two and a half thousand miles that lay between the airmail's success and failure. Pilots flew in relays. When the mail reached North Platte, Nebraska, it was Jack Knight's turn in the cockpit. Jack Knight was a tough, uh, hard-nosed pilot of the old school. Uh, he was recovering from a severely broken nose that he had suffered when flying into the side of a mountain two weeks before this time. Two hours later, Knight reached Omaha at 1 a.m. The mood on the ground was black. Jack was supposed to end his flight at Omaha, where another pilot would then fly the mail through to Chicago. The other pilot, however, recognizing the bad weather conditions that lay ahead, uh, refused to fly. If that flight is canceled, the whole grand experiment in night flying is ruined. Jack Knight's job was on the line, and all of his fellow pilots will not have a job. What happened next would make Knight a national hero. I think Jack hesitated about two seconds and said, I'll take the mail. The time is after midnight, bad weather ahead, Jack Knight had never flown the route in daytime, much less nighttime, yet he volunteered uh, to attempt uh, to make uh, this hazardous flight. Knight climbed back into his plane and took off toward Chicago, 400 miles away.
Field managers spread the word that night was pressing on. Across the prairie, farmers lit bonfires to guide him along the way. As night approached Iowa City just before 5 a.m., the field was pitch black. The caretaker had given up on him and gone to bed. But he heard the plane and came out just in time. Exhausted, Knight waited until daybreak. He dared not sleep. With 200 miles left, he wouldn't give up. Knight uh, managed to fly in bad weather through to Chicago, and as he neared the airmail field, his engine sputtered. Knight called out to his plane, just spit, old boy, we're here. At 8.40 a.m. on February 23rd, Jack Knight landed in Chicago. Relief pilots took the mail on to New York. The speed was breathtaking. The mail plane beat the train by three full days. Jack Knight had saved the airmail. The publicity convinced Congress to keep the money flowing. Otto Prager was right. The airplane had forever changed America's sense of time. Three weeks later, the Republicans took power, and the man who invented airmail was out of a job. The new administration warmed to the service. It was laying the groundwork for commercial aviation in a way no private company could afford to do. In 1924, the post office created one of the greatest engineering achievements of its day, a lighted airway stretching 2,400 miles across the continent. It must have been a tremendously dramatic sight, a series of rotating beacons that indicated both emergency fields and then a powerful beacon that indicated his landing field powerful enough really to turn night into day. It was a tremendous undertaking uh, given the technology of the time. Pilot Dean Smith said it best. I wish everyone could have the excitement of those first hesitant probes across the dark plains. We were like children venturing from home, each time daring a bit further then running back, filled with awe at what we had done. We felt the fear of the unknown, the excitement of pioneering, and the satisfaction of accomplishment. In its nine years, the airmail flew 14 million miles and carried 300 million letters. By the mid-1920s, the airmail operation was without question the most successful aeronautic enterprise in the world. The idea of flying a 3,600-mile air route day and night with astonishing regularity uh, was a truly unique enterprise and gained the admiration of aviators around the world. With skill, daring, and courage, the pilots of the U.S. airmail service had overcome the impossible and connected a nation. But an era was coming to a close. The post office's job was done. In 1925, Congress began chartering off mail routes to private enterprise, creating American Airlines, TWA, 
and united. Many airmail pilots flew for the new airlines, carrying the first passengers as America took to the air. The human price of the airmail service was, of course, high. 34 young men that lost their lives while flying the mail between 1918 and 1927. Flying the airmail was a very courageous thing to do. Some would even say foolhardy in some of the ways that it was done. It was done earlier than it probably should have been. It was typical American and typical pioneering. It wasn't necessarily logical, but it was definitely American. I loved what I did. We could fly at any altitude, fly under bridges, drop a newspaper to our friends if we wanted to. Today, they sit up there at 35,000 feet. What fun could they have? Oh, those were great days. I still think about it when I go to sleep at night.